welcome back to another episode of Into the Word, your weekly bite-sized dose of Bible. With me, Pastor Jonty and... Rev Ness. How are you? <laughs> Good. Good to see you. Full of energy today. I yeah, love it. Yeah, I'm pumped. I'm yeah. excited about this one. So after spending some time in uh, Epiphany, uh, yes. we are going to jump over to the Transfiguration today. Love that. Um, yeah, which is going to be really exciting. Um, so... Uh, Give it to us, brother. I reckon we just dive straight in. Yeah. Let's go. So if you want to follow along, it's from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to something. 2 to uh, 9. 2 to 9. <laughs> Thank you. I was just going to read mm-hmm. until the story finished. <laughs> the Transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before him. Before them, sorry. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say because they were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Bum, bum, bum. I love this story. It's a good one, isn't it's it? It's so cool. Mm. I think if you're a listener of Filthy Hope, um, we've talked about this before. Um, it's about a year ago, so go back and find it. If you just mm. search the Transfiguration, it'll be in there somewhere. Um, but, yeah, what, what's your immediate response to this passage, Ness? Oh, being shit scared up a mountain, really, and having skied and hiked in mountains and having been at um, Zermatt just as fresh as um, September last year Mm. and being in the mountain and watching the cloud cover come over and block out all view and not be able to see too far in front of you. Mm. That's actually really scary. So when the boys um, say that they're frightened, I can understand what that feels like, not knowing, you know, two steps in front of you covered in this cloud cover. Must have been really scary. I mean, they've just, Jesus has said, come on, guys, let's go for a little bit of a hike up um, the mountain and let's go and have a little, you know, pray together. And then they get enveloped in this cloud and Elijah and Moses appear. I mean, that's that's got to have been frightening. Mm. These dudes that these um, young men would have um, read about and known about to see them in the flesh um, would have been alarming to say the least, you know, and to see Jesus dazzling in in a glowing white and, and I think it's brilliant that they describe it as whiter than bleach could make anything. Yeah, Is that it how it goes? Whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. Yeah, yeah. that's very white. <laughs> whiter than even my parents could bleach my cricket whites back in the day when they get grass stains. Like literally glowing, bedazzling. Yeah. And this passage is um, quite apocalyptic. Yes. Yeah, yeah. In and, nature. And when, when you talk about apocalyptic, we uh, apocalyptic literature is a thing that we read in scripture. Um, it shows up a lot. Uh, most of the book of Revelation is what's mm. called apocalyptic literature. There's also some stuff in Ezekiel and the book of Daniel as well. And this word apocalypse, uh, when we talk about apocalyptic literature, isn't in, when, you know, when we think of like post-apocalyptic movies with mm. the, the world ending and you know, big disaster movies and aliens mm. and mm. diseases and all like the, mm-hmm. the world coming to an end. It, the root word is a Greek word which usually um, is to do with God revealing some truth mm. or unveiling something. Um, so when we think of uh, Saul on the road to Damascus having in the sense of the word apocalypse, an mm. apocalyptic experience, God unveiling something. Yes. Um, and cloud is often used in the Old Testament at mountains and clouds as the um, – they use that motif a lot yeah. as revelation and uh, revealing God's nature and who yeah. God is. And I think one of the other beautiful things in Revelation in this particular passage is that God – thunderously his voice is heard yeah and he says um what are the words listen to the listen to this is my son whom, whom I, I love. love listen to him listen to him mm. another reason to be pretty frightened I'm thinking mm. hearing that and um 
And 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 to point back to another bit of scripture, we hear similar words, don't we? Yeah. Um, when um, the dove descends on Christ at his baptism. With John the Baptist. Yeah. Yep. This is my son whom I'm well pleased. Yeah. I believe is the words that God thunders out. So it's it's a big moment and Jesus' divinity is revealed to these yep. few chosen disciples. In the true sense of apocalypse in the Greek, ancient Greek sense. Yeah. Yeah. We're, it, epic really. Yeah. How lucky are these dudes mm. to have been the ones that he chose to take up the mountain to reveal his um, – to go from being the fleshy man, Jesus the man, to being Jesus God man, fully divine. Mm. I'm thinking that that is – just epic. I would have loved to have been there that day, but I couldn't have kept my mouth shut. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's another example of Jesus. <laughs> like as if people that have seen something that incredible, <laughs> like, yeah, I'm just not going to tell anyone. Yeah, Jesus says actually just keep your mouth shut. Yeah. What is that with him with his miracles? He just wanted it yeah. to – it's a cluster of keep your mouth shut until I'm gone and then you can reveal and say what is. Yeah, it's interesting I, and – I, I do you have a sense of why maybe because I, I, I have my theory as to why. Please. Is, I – I, I wonder if it's to do with Jesus wanting people to experience God's miracle and God's wondrous, like the stuff that he's doing, to experience Christ firsthand for themselves, not to hear mm. it secondhand through someone mm. else telling them. As, as tempting as it probably is to be like, I've just seen someone get healed or I have just been healed mm. or I've just walked up a mountain with this guy who I thought was just a man but all of a sudden <laughs> he's God as well and these two phantoms showed up of prophets whose <laughs> name might like, how are you not going to tell people about that? That's crazy. But I think the point is that Jesus wants people to experience mm. the incredible radical transformative nature of who Jesus is firsthand mm, I love um, because that. the impact is just going to be so much and, and it, encouraging people to discover Christ for themselves, mm. um, not through some tall tale that someone's telling them because they experience an incredible thing, which doesn't discredit the tale itself, but it's just, I, I wonder if it's Jesus going, people are going to really, really lose their minds when they experience this firsthand. That's really powerful, Jonty. I've never stopped to think of it like that. I think it's got huge merit. I think that's a very Jesus-y thing, really, mm. what you just said. Mm. I also wonder if the revelation to just this cluster of guys, because there was like 12 of them and it's only just a couple that he's doing this major revelation to, mm. is so that when he does the big dying on the cross and revelation and he does reveal himself to these same guys again uh, sometime later in that 40 days after his death and, and resurrection, he does reveal himself to the disciples. I wonder if it was to give them a pre-knowing, hey, dudes, this is what I'm going to look like. When this happens, don't freak out because actually this is – this is it. I'm just giving you a little bit of a a foretaste of what's to come so that when you see that next time, you can actually attest to what you've seen today on the mountain and you can assure everybody, hey, it's okay. This is Jesus. He is the resurrected one. Yeah. He is the Messiah. I wonder if it was that. Mm. I yeah. don't like surprises. <laughs> I'm not good with surprises. I don't like to not know I'm not good with that. And for me, if I happened to have been a disciple, this would have worked really well for me mm. to at least have somebody assure me that it was all okay because they had seen it before. Mm. I think that would have that testimony in itself would have been really powerful mm. for the yeah, yeah. for the start of the birth of the Christian church as we know it. At Pentecost, which was only like 50-odd days after this gig. For sure. Yeah. You know? It's a big story, isn't it? Yeah, it's crazy. And there's so much like texture in terms of like referencing back to Old mm. Testament scripture as well. Mm. And the, the last thing I want to point out as well before we wrap this thing up is that um, this is another example in the same way that you identified Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist where we actually see mm. uh, God the Father, God the Son and God the Spirit mm. present together and so not only are they getting a revelation of the divinity of jesus 
but they're actually getting a glimpse at God's self in community with God's self. Yeah. <gasps> which is the very nature I think of God is God mm. in community, mm. um, which is super powerful. Yeah, it's a very super powerful, powerful piece of scripture. Yeah. It just yeah. makes me feel assured, I think, gives me a sense of great comfort. Yeah. That we will see, I think it's apocalyptic also because it's a foretaste for us as humans living today mm. that we are going to see Jesus in his full divinity um, when we also move on to the next part of living in eternity with him. Mm. It's pretty awesome. Really, really awesome Bible passage. I, I love yeah. this story. It's a good one. Um, if you want to hear us talk even longer about this, we actually did a whole episode of Filthy Hope about this. If you don't know what Filthy Hope is, you're in for a treat. Uh, Ness and I talk at length in, in episodes of Filthy Hope. If you go back to episode 39, which will be linked below, um, we spent a whole hour talking about this passage as well. So if this has sparked your interest, go and listen to that. If you have anything that you want to share with us, mm. um, get in touch. We'd love Please. to hear what you think about um, this, this passage. Was there anything else you wanted to share before we... I suppose if anybody has a special passage they'd like us to mm. do a bite-sized unpack of. I mean, we're not doing a hugely deep dive, but um, at first blush, if you'd like us to do that, please r- write into us because yeah. we'd love to go there. We're going to attempt to, you know, smash out all the big stuff. Absolutely. Mm. Um, that just about does us. True to our mission statement, this is a bite-sized chunk of Bible, so we're going to leave you there. Again, if you have anything that you want to share with us, any interpretations, thoughts, mm. questions, please do get in touch. All the links will be down below. Uh, But we'll see you next time for another edition of Into the Word. See you then.